so thrilled to have a, the co-author of one of the most talked about books in philanthropy this year, Do More Than Give. Mark Kramer is also creating quite a lot of buzz around collective impact, which is all about how philanthropy can align with other sectors to create better community solutions. So for this next session, what we're going to do is hear from Mark and go through the six practices that are outlined in his book, Do More Than Give while also hearing from local, um, from our colleagues in the room who are actually putting these practices into action. So, um, Mark Kramer is in the house, and I'd like you all to help me welcome him. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, morning. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, I'm really thrilled. Uh, I actually first thought we were going to be next door, and we could, I would be on the uh, before. I'm also really thrilled to be doing this because uh, I've talked about these ideas and the book. Uh, hold it up to plug copies, <laughs> um, but we've, we've I've talked about this really all over the world. But I've never done what uh, Nancy Jameson and San Diego grant makers and Marissa have set up here, which is to have local grant makers who can talk from their personal experience about each of the uh, ideas, each of the six principles in the book. Uh, so I'm really thrilled to be able to do it this way here with you and, and look forward to that. I want to spend just a few minutes, uh, but the real challenge, I think, is to bridge the kind of experience that Eduardo talked about, where an individual nonprofit organization is making a transformative difference in an individual life. But the question is, how do you bridge from that to the human development data. How do you bridge from helping a handful of individual people to actually achieving change at scale? And what I've come to believe is that the conventional approach to philanthropy works very well for small nonprofits, for organizations that can help people like Eduardo in individual cases. But I actually don't think it works very well as a way of addressing large-scale social problems. But if we want to do more, if we want to really achieve large-scale change, which I believe we can, and I've seen examples of donors do, if we want to do that, we have to go about things differently. It's not, so the challenge in writing the book was, what do donors need to do? What can they do beyond writing checks if they're going to really help solve social problems? And what it really made me confront is this idea that giving away money well and solving social problems are two different things. So the idea is that donors have to do more. More than my chip. And it's hard work. But it's actually very, very rewarding work. Because you can begin to see the needle move. And you can really become personally engaged in the issue. But with the part that you really want to focus on achieving an outcome, you have to do things differently. And so when we think about philanthropy, some problems are simple. You know, if somebody can't afford to go to college and they need a scholarship, you write a scholarship, you write the check, that problem is solved. And some problems are complicated. You know, if there aren't enough hospital beds in the community, or if the hunger clinic has problems with its logistics, these are things you can fix. Again, you can write a check and fix them. But if you think about fixing health care in America, or fixing the educational system, or the kinds of problems that philanthropy really likes to grapple with. Those are complex. You can't just write a check and fix it. In fact, we don't know the answer. We don't know how to fix those. And that requires a different approach. It requires that our role as funders, as donors, is not about funding the answer because we don't know the answer and we couldn't impose it, but it's about funding a process that can cause people to change their behavior. An open-ended process that lets people figure out solutions for themselves. And really, most of what we're talking about in this book falls into that category. If donors who have advocacy, I think, is a, a truly important tool that we see again and again in the book as one of the ways that donors can make change. One of the challenges of advocacy, of course, is it doesn't sound quite as polite as, you know, funding a benefit. And it's not. But if we really want to achieve social change, we got to make change. And the government is the biggest player by far on almost every social issue we can play. And if you're not going to try and change government, 
you're going to have a very hard time achieving change at scale. So, is that you, you can't lobby for specific legislation. You can't try and get specific people elected. But anything that has to do with an issue, you're allowed to do. Anything that has to do with a topic, you're allowed to do. And anything that is not legislative, anything that involves the executive branch, working with mayors, working with governors, working with the White House, those things are completely open to do. It really only applies to lobbying in legislation, for legislation, in the legislative branch. So there's really a lot of room and much more. But again, we have the, the real privilege of having people here, not just to talk about it like me, but who've actually done it. So John, please come up. Oh. Thanks for that, and thanks for this invitation. It's a real privilege to be invited to share a few minutes with you all, who I now as colleagues and friends. So, um, uh, especially, in, in fact, part of my hire at the Foundation for Change was a conversation between myself and the board of directors about committing to a cause. So the way we ended up framing it, it took us a little while to get to it, but we ended up committing the overwhelming bulk of, of the work we do to what we call immigrant and border communities. In this and what I want to suggest to you is that my experience might be similar to yours, and that advocacy, to my mind, just is a natural result of uh, following your heart. And, uh, I'll share with you also one example in, in our brief, my brief experience at the Foundation for Change, a new organization that we've now worked with on a number of different projects called the Asociación de Fornaleros, which is the day laborers ranks. And one of them in particular, a young woman named Nidia Ramirez, just impressed me no end. She has now ended up working with the Asociación de Fornaleros, working with um, house workers. Her mother is a house worker. Nidia also, as I got to know her, revealed to me that she uh, was a dreamer somebody who had been brought to this country as a small, small child and did not have documents to go to college. Well, long story short, if you follow your heart and you follow those stories and you follow, you end up needing to advocate within your networks. And some of you, given the constraints that you may have in your institutions, it may be your personal networks, but I'd argue that you should be advocating within philanthropic networks. I'll be hitting some of you up later today. <laughs> you need to advocate within the public sphere, as was mentioned, and you need to, we need to talk politics, folks. We cannot pretend that we can create the San Diego that we want to create if we don't want to get down and dirty and talk, talk politics. Um, Nidia was among a group of people who, um, so for me, uh, advocacy is a necessary and logical outgrowth of a commitment, a commitment that we make as people of privilege and a commitment that we make as philanthropists. Thank you very much. So the second principle we want to talk about is what we call in the book blending topic experts. But there are really sort of three ways we think about donors affecting and touching and using business to achieve their goals. The first way is about just using business know-how. So again, it's an example of using business know-how through charity to help have an impact on a social problem. And there are tremendous resources there, not just in large companies like GE, but each of you who has been involved in business has a set of skills. Tom Siebel, the second one is to use your money. And there are two ways you can do it. One is by proxy voting, bringing up shareholder resolutions at companies whose stock you own. This too is not polite. <laughs> the, um, the other way, of course, to use your money is through impact investment, to invest in for-profit enterprises and investments that help you achieve social impact. So I want to, at this point, um, ask Heather Hurdo, from, who's the head of corporate giving from Life Technologies, to come up and give us an example of the role of corporations. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. I think it's such a great honor, um, as, as uh, Don said, to be among your peers and, and now people who I consider to be friends to be able to talk about what the technology is doing. Um, I think the best way to really uh, tell the story of, of how we've been able to take some of the principles that he mentions in blending that profit with a purpose is to really tell what I call an evolutionary story. It's not quite revolutionary, <laughs> not fast enough to be revolutionary, but it's evolutionary. Um, for me, I started this business working with these, so we make these investments, and they really are investments in our communities based on bringing business to our organizations. Um, the second thing that I walked away with, which really kind of inspired me and still inspires me to this day, is that if every corporation or if every company in the United States and across the world did the right thing, 
we don't even have a need for individual donors in the world. If we all stepped up to the plate and gave the amount of money that we should to take care of those neighborhoods where we take employees and we take resources and give back in every true measure, we really wouldn't need individual donors. And so those things really resonated. But what I saw in front of me was two things. One, a global volunteer day of service. And two, a very broad open door policy about their, about their let's say, grant making, sponsorships, whatever that may be. The Light Technologies Foundation was sort of a separate entity just being created at that time. In, I'll fast forward a couple of years. So we've created an, um, a company, excuse me, a company um, program called Giving Back a Life, which really comes to three major areas, donating our resources, <coughs> which now the Light Technologies Foundation comes under, the second being sharing our skills and focusing on volunteerism, um, and the third being strictly volunteerism and focusing on sharing our time. So we've been able to sort of evolve and, and now step yeah. forth with, as you mentioned, I found it very interesting that, God forbid, we try to fix education. That is exactly what my CEO asked me to do. <laughs> he came to me, he's a visionary, he's great, he says, yeah, we need to fix education. Like, it's just, yeah, we're going to take out the trash. And I'm like, yeah, world peace, what, what's next, right? So taking that sort of idea, um, really evolving to the next level, was taking all the principles that Mark mentioned, which is taking that business know-how, taking all the shared values that you have, and really coming together. So what I thought to myself was, what can we do well? What we do well is science, and how we can make a social difference is to focus on science education. So we've developed a program called Innovation Nation, which is focused on K through 12. It's a different, it's a different angle at heading towards fixing education because again, it's not entirely broken. But it's really taking the resources that we have, including all, all of our employees, making them light tech mentors, allowing students to come into our facility and see what a scientist looks like, giving a tour of our facility, um, talking with uh, their teachers and mentoring them to provide the skills that they don't have at this time, and quite honestly, turning things on its head on giving some financial resources as well as our products and getting them into the hands of kids. So again, that was sort of a, I'm getting the you know sign for the, the short version, but we plan for the little pro project within a year um, and we'll probably reach about 12,000 students. Not meant to be, you know, 100,000 students or 100,000 classrooms at a time because that's not how we want to focus. We want to really spend time, we want it to be in depth, and we want to be able to <coughs> reach out to those students and provide the resources as well as those teachers and focus on that. So our foundation will continue to support it with a million dollar grant in the first year. We will partner with people who bring things to the table on their collective impact theory that we do not. Groups like Junior Achievement on Career Focus, and so really, again, it's, it's, a, it's a true case study in everything that you've taught in your books. And again, I just have a sign, so thank you for your time. <laughs> How do you get everybody in the community working toward the same set of goals? <coughs> well, it turns out it's not enough just to bring them together and tell them to collaborate. You need an infrastructure. And it is tremendously powerful when you can get these fragmented, isolated organizations to begin to work together toward a common goal and with a shared measurement system. So right now we have this model of philanthropy of what I call isolated impact. Right? We pick an organization or a program and we fund that because we hope that's the answer. And then we hire an evaluator and we say, hold everything else constant. I just want to know what that particular program did to solve the problem. And as a result, each funder and each nonprofit measures progress on their own tools in their own way. And we can't say anything about whether one nonprofit is doing something better than another one because they're measuring things differently. We can't really talk about evidence based. We have little changes over time that increases the alignment of organizations and enables them to learn from each other and become more effective is a great way to address social problems. So we've got two folks from the community here who are going to talk about um, peer networks and this idea of collective impact. And let me start with Ralph Achenbach. You pretend we're some dancers to you. I don't have to finish the thought. Uh, I'm really even can put her sign up. So uh, wait, um, it, uh, good morning. It's a great honor for me and uh, proud to be here. Uh, Thank you, Mark, for your standing work on collective impact. Um, I think the Senegal Fiji Forum can be a classic example of uh, some of the ideas that Mark describes in his book, uh, especially how to implement a uh, peer network, uh, including creating a network, uh, creating conditions for uh, co uh, collaboration, uh, commitment to on uh, ongoing learning, and a proliferation of networks on really emerging issues. And as a past chair of the Refugee Forum, I'm going to turn over to Ralph to give us uh, details on each of these uh, points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fonsi, and thank you very much, everyone. 
Before I delve into a little more detail on the Refugee Forum as a peer network, I just want to provide some context. I see the stage has already been set, but still I want to let you all know a little bit about the, the refugee communities. Um, but not before, San Diego is the refugee resettlement capital of the world. Community. We welcome more refugees who are forced to flee war and persecution abroad than any other community across the country or indeed around the globe. And that's and Luckily, San Diego, in addition to being the refugee resettlement capital of the world, also is home to an astounding array of refugee service providers, each and every one of them with extremely innovative and effective programming. And these agencies have come together, leveraging their individual strengths as a peer network, very similar to the one that Mark just described um, as, as the model peer network that's also featured in, in this um, marvelous article. So the San Diego Refugee Forum is a multi. So the San Diego Refugee Forum is a multi-agency collaborative. The core of it are nonprofit organizations that focus specifically on refugee issues, but there are also members from the um, public service sector, mainstream organizations. There are healthcare providers, educational institutions, some elected officials, and also um, some government agencies that deal with public health and other issues as well. Um, I want to uh, focus on just one example of the work of the Refugee Forum as a peer network that highlights how organizations coming together truly can achieve more impact or collective impact. It's well, tomorrow night that the San Diego Refugee Forum is hosting the second annual International Night of Networking. And it's an event that is aimed at connecting refugees who have international professional credentials with industry leaders from our regional economy here. Now, each and every one organization individually could have looked at that problem problem and try to solve it. But instead they came together, um, again, both the refugee service providers and some of the mainstream providers, um, government agencies and so on and so forth, to put on this event that's really going to be much more effective at connecting our global economy with that international professional talent that is present in our <coughs> communities but so often untapped. And the hope is to not only benefit the individuals and their peers, the refugees that will be participating and that will hopefully find more meaningful employment and employment that can help them build assets and really live their version of the American dream, um, but, but also for the community to benefit and perhaps even humanity as a whole. Because um, after all, Albert Einstein was a refugee. So once again, thank you very much. Um, one of the concepts that we talk about in the book is the idea of adaptive leadership. And it comes from work uh, that a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard, Ron Heifetz, first developed. And it's the notion that you can't make other people change. But you can create the conditions that lead them to change, decide to change for themselves. And, you know, in philanthropy, we tend to... And this, we think, is really the role where funders can be tremendously powerful in empowering people to change, in making sure that it's not just the most powerful voices that are heard. You know, it's not just ExxonMobil governing the debate on global warming. But as funders, we can ensure that people who don't have the resources for themselves, that their voices can be heard. We can ensure Rocky Barros is going to come and talk a little bit about this approach with the Jacobs Center. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Nancy Jameson for this opportunity. Uh, she said, you know, would you come and, and give some brief words on this book that you're in? And I had no idea I was in it, so I bought the book and I read it uh, as soon as I could. Uh, so I appreciate that. And also, I want to thank Valerie uh, Jacobs, happy here, for allowing me time off work to be here today. So, thank you. Um, so anyway, uh, when I was at, at the core of doing these two uh, principles that Mark talks about, I think is really relationship building. And I think that relationship building is really the first thing that we really need to do uh, in these communities because that's how we have the open and honest conversations. If not, sometimes we go around in circles and circles and we try things and then at some point in time somebody decides to tell you the truth and what they really, <laughs> really, what they really wanted to do. And so I think that's critical. But, but unfortunately, even though it's the easiest thing to do, it's probably the, the one that we hesitate the most to start with. And so, for example, the reason um, that this is important is because that's, once again, Mark talks about this in the book, is around um, seeking the opportunities. And that's how you seek the opportunities, by, by building the relationships. And building those relationships, the most important part is that you're going to listen and observe. And I know that that's you know, what I told the uh, So So that's basically what I did. In, in 1997, we started the work in, in southeastern San Diego. And one of the things that I noticed as I 
walked around the community there, is that I noticed after school, hundreds of kids hung out at the corner of Market in Euclid. So I went and hung out at the corner of Market in Euclid. And, and I found out that these kids were all hanging out because they didn't have anywhere to go after school. And, and so some of them were so in trouble. Well, where do you go sometimes? And they said, well, sometimes we go to you know, the Boys and Girls Club, the Campbell Boys and Girls Club, the Jackie Robinson Y, Metro, and so forth. Right? So then what I do, I headed over to, to Metro and the Y and all those places. And I said, hey, guys, there's a bunch of kids that are hanging out out here. Would you like to learn what they want to do? And maybe how we might get involved in helping them come up with a solution for them hanging out there. And so they said, sure. So we started this youth adult learning partnership where we brought these agencies together and these youth together and, and we sat there together, it's kind of appropriate here, at a different table. We sat at the table to talk about what these kids were going through and the kinds of things that they were looking for. And, and, and it was also an opportunity to give these kids a different role in their community. And, and to sit at the table with different people that they had never sat at the table. And then we came up with some solutions and we started a lot of programs. I can't get into those programs because I don't have enough time. But uh, there were things like a teen center and writer's block and so forth that hopefully some of you get a chance to, to see that. So, so when, you, um, when you find these opportunities, then what we have to do is that we have to inspire people into action. right? And I believe that everybody has a role in community work. And when I tell teach you as your favorite team, your favorite sport team, right? You believe they can win, you want them to win, and you support them to win. And that's what we have to believe. And that's how we have to act. So once you've inspired people, you also have to build leadership. And so <clears throat> leadership is a really key role. And Mark talks about this. And, and it's about actually giving people the opportunity to get involved in things that they never thought they would have the opportunity to get involved. And you bring the, the expertise that you need to the table, to sit at the table with them so that they can learn that, that, those skills that they'll need to come up with the solutions for these problems. But it's not, it's not that you bring the experts in and have them take over. And it is important, and, and I hope and, and, and I challenge all of you to build and to create a new table in your community and in your work. And to bring folks that have never sat around those tables together around those tables to do this work. And it's going to create tensions. I mean, we've had a lot of them. Uh, and people have asked me, well, why is he or she at the table? And I said, well, the same reason you're here at the table. <laughs> and then they're saying, well, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want them at the table. And I said, well, if you don't want them at the table, then you, I'm not going to tell them. You tell them you don't want them at the table. And it's interesting because nobody ever said, nobody ever had the courage to tell somebody else to leave this table. It's never happened, okay? Uh, and people do leave the table on their own. But it's interesting that a lot of them do come back. And so, so I hope that, that if anything, uh, you know, I leave with you this message is, is that about the table. And also I hope that some of you will take some time and knock on your neighbor's door and find out a little bit more about the table. The last thing we talk about in the book is learning in order to change. And it's a kind of different view of evaluation. And this idea of learning over time of using collective impact, of empowering people, of being able to make gradual improvements over time as the participants are able to learn from each other to become more aligned, is a very, very different way of thinking about evaluation. And it suggests that what foundations need is not an academic study that proves that this versus that control group had this particular outcome over X years, but needs a sort of continuous flow of information and knowledge on a timely basis that can help them make more knowledgeable, more effective decisions going forward. And I think uh, Joe Pons from the Irvine Foundation can talk about their experience with that. I think I want to start just by, uh, uh, we were uh, the kind of foundation, uh, kind of giver that Mark described at the onset of his uh, comments. We were trying to do some good things by making some good grants to some good organizations, and we're pretty happy to have that be our existence for a very long period of time. In about the last 10, 12 years, uh, we've kind of made a different approach. We've made a rather concerted effort to not only be more strategic, be more focused, uh, a little more humble in our expectations and uh, in our estimation of our own capabilities to make things happen, uh, but also to build that learning culture that he talks about in practice uh, six. And so Nancy asked me to give a very specific example. Um, we just launched a, a change in the way we're going to focus towards a actually expanding engagement in the arts for all Californians. And unless you're deep in the arts, this sounds like just a little bit of vocab. But it actually is going to be starting to pioneer a different way of thinking about arts, artistic engagement, 
and hopefully being able to open up artistic resources in the state to more and different people to um, experience creativity and artistic expression in different ways. We're very excited about it. But core to this is going to be um, supporting arts organizations, a lot of the nonprofit arts organizations, to kind of build some capacity to do some things differently. And it's going to be a long journey, and we're aware of that. We would not be able to do it um, without, or we don't think we'd be able to do it, do it very well, if we did not have a lot of learning and experience from some projects we've been doing. So we've been doing an uh, arts regional initiative over the last um, you know, eight-year initiative. Rather than just make a bunch of grants, we've had it all organized, we have the two phases, we've been working with six different cohorts of arts organizations. And with that, we've been running evaluations, one for each of phase, but they've been more on ongoing real-time evaluation, uh, particularly in the second phase now, where rather than wait to do the report that Mark talks about, we're sharing the information as we go with the cohorts of arts organizations. At the end of the day, I imagine most of my life in business. Uh, so we learned a lot from that project. We're now going to inject the DNA of that into our new strategy going forward, and, uh, and I have completely embraced the idea <coughs> going forward. Uh, the evaluation and learning is going to be a share-as-you-go process because uh, if not, I don't think we'd have the guts to take on something as ambitious as we're doing. Thank you. Well, first, just thank everyone for being here and to Mark and to all of our speakers and even helping me.